Is it the end of the world? Is it the end of a cycle? Is this Ragnarok? Is this the Kali Yuga? What is happening? Where are we going? Welcome to the Great Point Pagans podcast, Ragnarok and the End Times, episode 3. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Greyhorn Pagan Podcast. This is Ragnarok episode three already. Um, never thought we'd get to a, uh, a third episode. Um, never thought that we'd have so much to talk about concerning Ragnarok and the end times and the yogas and all of that stuff. So guys, thank you all for being here. Uh, first things first, I want to wish a very happy birthday to Raven, Raven Wolfgar. Um, happy birthday. Thank happy you. birthday, man. Thank survived birthday, another dude. year. <laughs> uh, this is 44, I think. I 44? Oh, that's a good number. 44. It's going to be a magical year, bro. I actually had a, a lady at work uh, when, when I told her I was taking off for my birthday. And she, she looks at me and she goes... Oh, so are, what are you uh, turning uh, 28, 30, what? And I'm like, 44. And she, she was like, no. Oh, wait, yeah. I had to pull my license and show her. I'm like, yeah, 1978, that's when I was born. And she was like, how, how the hell do you do it? I was like, lots of water. That's lots a of great water will keep you moisturized. You're fine. Don't spend a lot of time in the sun. You'll be all right. That's a great compliment. Okay, um, let's... Just start with the uh, the introductions first, since uh, we have only two people at the moment who are here for part one and part two. It's me and Chalavash. So, um, birthday boy, how about you? Introduce yourself first. Tell tell the good people where they can can find you and um, how they can can congratulate you. Oh, absolutely. Um... Name's Raven Wolfgar. I read tarot, oracles, and runes. I do that Monday through Friday on uh, YouTube, BitChute, CloudHub, Rumble, and Odyssey. Uh, I do have a link tree where you can find me on any social media. If you want uh, a private reading, you throw me something off the Amazon wish list. Anything 35 and under gets you two readings and a birthday reading. And anything over that, you know, we talk about it. I tend to add a couple more readings. So you'll, you can get like double the readings just by kind of like going above that $35 uh, tier if you want. Of course, that's all voluntary. If that's not your thing, you're going to just enjoy the free videos. Today, we did a live stream, and I was just kind of giving away three card readings. And this Saturday, there will be a live stream, and that will consist of anyone donating to the, uh, to the coffee page for the tribe gets a three-card reading. Anything, uh, like if you, if you subscribe to the Patreon, I give you six cards. So definitely check us out then, and uh, we're hopefully we'll raise some more money for the tribe and uh, get some better videos going. And that's and also I'm an avid tabletop role player, so <laughs> you will probably hear some of those references in here today. Which is exactly why we're uh, happy to have you here because mythology and role playing games it has a lot of hand overlap. Hand, yeah. So. All right, uh, next one, Mr. Light Elf. Um, we haven't seen you before. We haven't really seen you in the in the tribe, not on Telegram at least. Uh, you are active on our minds, of course. So yeah. introduce yourself and just tell us, tell the good people where they can find you. Uh, well, um, I'm uh, a writer for the most part uh, from Norway. Uh, I have slimmed my presence on the internet quite <laughs> radically, you can say. Um, so I'm not on Telegram, <laughs> but I'm on the minds. Um, other than that, um, I have an art uh, channel called uh, 
loose all, which means light off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and most of what I have done is not in English, so. Okay, sure, but sweet. Um, Mr. Warlock. Welcome. Good to have you here. Introduce Man, yourself. Man, good to be here. I am Sarcastic Warlock. You can find me in the deepest, darkest holes on uh, Telegram. But uh, <laughs> I'm usually on there just ranting like a madman. You could also uh, check out my show called High Magic. It's uh, with James True. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I just study. Uh, moved to a giant forest um, out in Kentucky country and and uh, I'm figuring out how to homestead in a forest, which is a whole new ball game for me. Uh, loving it, man. Yeah, we've uh, we've seen pictures, we've seen posts. It looks great, man, and uh, great to uh, great to have you here. We have another podcaster on the show as well, Deep Share Podcasts. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, I'm Andy Rouse from the Deep Share Podcast. And again, really appreciate you inviting me on here. This sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you can find me at the Deep Share on social media. You can find me on all the regular podcast outlets and YouTube and Odyssey. I, um, I'm all over the board. I mean, I'm fascinated by consciousness, but I'm also fascinated by our antiquity. And the more I look into things, the more I see that a lot of our history has been relegated to fiction and fairy tales. So that's kind of my part of this. And, and I've been researching what's called the box saga for quite a while. Um, it's one of not the only, but one of, you know, a few very suspicious and interesting tales from the North that I think uh, has played a huge role in our history. And we just are, everything's coming to light, man. Box Saga is a uh, interesting text for sure. I've been seeing more about it. It's uh, it's picking up a lot of steam in the uh, heathen and pagan communities as well. So yeah, yeah. Supposedly reported like two million people are interested in, in the Box Saga these days or so. I mean, I don't know where they get those numbers anyway, though, right? Two million is quite a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Like right? Worldwide, yeah, that's fair. It. Yeah, worldwide. worldwide yeah. It worldwide i mean it's an interesting story nonetheless like even if some of it's not completely true if some of it's obscured or misinterpreted or whatever it leads to a much deeper core story that all cultures kind of uh, relate back to without knowing it, it almost uh, out of muscle memory it seems it's like you know if we've had something in the past that lasted a really long time it probably plays out as almost human nature at this point with all the symbolism and everything so yeah it's an interesting story and outside the podcast i'd have to agree with mr warlock uh, my wife and i are trying to figure out how the hell to get as far away from you know the state quote unquote as you can and buy a bunch of land and we're growing tons of food on the small plot of land we have right now but we're just hoping that this is a microcosm to the eventual macrocosm. Nice. So oh, yeah, okay. thanks. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you for coming on. And last but not least, another hopeful potential homesteader farm owner, Mr. Joshua Fertini, Chalavash, bro. Good to have you. Great to be back, man. I love these conversations. Can't wait to dig into the meeting into this one tonight, dude. Everybody here should know where to find me. I mean, if not, Telegram, the tribe, mines, I'm uh, all over there. I'm Joshua Thane of the Greyhorn Pagans. So you can uh, you can find me in, in the tribe, screaming my head off of the day. Yeah, I believe that, like, it, it, most times... If there is stuff posted in the tribe, uh, it comes from you. So <laughs> you're uh, you're very uh, you're very active. We've done a lot of um, podcasts together too, and uh, like you're you're here again for uh, for episode three. So yeah, great great to have you. Great to have have you all. And um, yeah, let's let's kick it off. We've been uh, we've been talking a bit before uh before we uh, started the recording 
So um, who who wants to uh, who wants to kick it off? Who has a question for the real? Can I spark it off with a question? Sure. Who, does any any of you guys uh, familiar with the, uh, the the Celtic Tuatha De Danann? And then yes. there's another group yep. called the Tuath Day, right? The Tuath Day is the tribe of the gods. And from every piece of writing that I could find, it says that the tribe of the gods, the Tuath Day, basically are immigrants from Northern Europe that were a group of migrant gods that came down and taught them things. And I, I just stumbled upon that the other day and it just struck me, you know, like I, I did not realize that that link was even there. Hmm. Has anybody else seen anything or read into this? Yes. Yeah. I'm quite familiar. It seems like we're, I'm not the only one, which is great. Yeah. To all the day, Danan, that's also the children or tribe of Danu. So it takes you in a number of different directions too. But um, my colleague and I have uh, researched quite a bit and, and he's kind of, he links it to the tribe of Dan as well. So that's an interesting kind of trail to, to go into because it's like the whole lost tribe, 13th tribe and all that. And it kind of ties into Fox Saga as well. Yep. But um, yeah, the Twatha Day Dana was supposedly very similar to the Anunnaki in legend. And what's interesting too, is that there was also a Twatha Day Anu. So, I mean, you kind of have that link there. And this is all across like Scythia, the Armenian Highlands, like this whole area, Ireland, Scotland, Northern England, all had these same types of tall, blonde or red hair, blue or green eyed, quote unquote, gods. Same with Quetzalcoatl and all yes. the rest in Mesoamerica, Veracocha. They have all these same yeah so and and yeah that's kind of what i've been doing i've been coming at it the angle of like and the ufo community absolutely hates this but i mean i'm taking away their toys I'm taking away their ancient aliens and just switching the l and the r it's like ancient aryan basically you, you can take it even further and bring it into uh the uh book of enoch like oh yeah when you when you look at what i i had this interesting thing i you know was christian all my life was a pastor for a while and then oh, wow. went to ministry school all that all that kind of thing and then ditched all of it uh got really nihilistic atheist with it for a while and then uh started getting into paganism so mm. um what it's a good path <laughs> yeah i love it i love it wouldn't change a thing but uh one of the things that I kind of when I when I started reexamining the Bible, I started looking at it from a whole different, obviously from a whole different perspective, and started seeing it more as a propaganda piece. And this became really interesting when I started getting into the Book of Enoch, because when you start thinking of it this way, now the Book of Enoch, what were the crimes of the Watchers, who mm -hmm. were uh, uh, punished by Yahweh and cursed by Yahweh? Like, what did they do? And it's basically exactly what. Uh, child of ash described like they showed up they started helping people and you know you could if you if you like i tend to think that everything is metaphor so mm -hmm. if you kind of roll with that metaphor they descended from above you know they descended they came down from the north call them hyperboreans atlanteans whatever the hell you want but i think that that well i'll call them hyperboreans because i like that best i think that they you know sort of descended from the north and uh in a really funny shape i don't know if we're allowed to say but uh it kind of migrated down from there and that books like the book of enoch and the bible uh were were designed specifically to demonize these people like uh, mm -hmm. how dare you come and start distributing knowledge to people who didn't have it uh it seems like at every time you you have a group of um strong people uh, like what Aryan actually represents the, the word itself anytime you have that there's going to be a splinter fa fraction that breaks off and and starts uh enforcing slavery and you know uh, basically the shadow of the Aryan emerges. right and it's also quite interesting that like for instance in this box saga how many of you guys are familiar with box saga a little okay so a little. that's a whole nother rabbit hole 
I don't think it should all be explained because it's a whole nother thing. But um, considering this is Ragnarok, Box Saga has three Ragnaroks in the story. Mm -hmm. The third being what you're describing right now, which is when the Catholics sent a papal army, a papal army, whatever, to uh, this place called Udenma, which was also called Hell, which is now called Helsinki and destroyed the last of these northern people and basically shrouded it from history so yeah. have you uh have you guys seen the, the flag from the isle of man no it's three legs standing in a triangle and on oh, one leg is yeah. a crown on another leg is a falcon and on the other leg is a crow and if mm. you look those legs are moving in a certain direction <laughs> there is a cycle of let's call it um the pagan gods the crown and the one god all ruling in a cycle right and, and if you look at the isle of man it's sitting with the crown at the top now on the bottom leg if it keeps moving the crow will be at the top and the falcon will be at the bottom the crown will be on the right we're, we're it's very moving. similar to that like serpent versus eagle symbolism too i could it's very similar you know that just goes in rotation you yeah know? you'll you'll you see, that see that in the bible a lot yeah, yeah you'll see that a lot isn't it on like the even the flag of mexico, mexico. has some yeah. some like yeah, that? the eagle defeating the serpent yeah yes. like um a lot of uh defeating serpents or chasing away serpents you know speaking of Ireland, you know, yeah. ch chasing away yeah. the serpents, uh, which is uh, thought to be the uh, the Druids, the pagans. Um, I am, and since we're also live on YouTube at the moment, so, uh, sorry that I didn't disclose that for now, but um, I'm trying to check both chats, and I have an interesting comment here. Um, the the Havi land the Havi lands. Um, one interesting thing I heard is that Norway comes from a Finnish king, who went to Norway and his name was Nori, and therefore it became Nori's way, Norway. Hmm. Uh, like kind of tying into the um, the box saga, I think, because that is a um, kind of an alternative writing of. Right. Um, like off pagan history, same with the um, the very much debated, I, I, actually, even hated uh, Ura Linda. Hmm. Actually, there were two two kings called uh, Nur and Gur. Uh, mm -hmm. This is in the legendary sagas, uh, uh, and uh, Nur was gifted the inland, and Gur was gifted all the islands. So they. they Kind of divided the realm between them uh, so norway is not related to the north the way to the north at all it's uh, the way to norse realm hmm. uh, yeah you you should know obviously uh, can you can you explain no, uh, it, a little a... more because that that is like it is your territory like literally <laughs> uh, no it, it's not really well known by people so uh, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a hidden lore there, <laughs> but I believe the Nor Norwegian royal bloodline, the, you know, uh, the Inglinger, uh, they came from they came from Sweden. But uh, there is also they are also related to to giants from uh, from the east, uh, and you, you could Joshua kind of place it. Giants. Uh, you can place them in Siberia, but, but uh, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of one of those kings. So, uh, so sorry. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's, that's okay. In Ragnarok, it, it describes it during the calling of Ragnarok that the giants come from, I think it's two different directions, and then another group of giants comes with the final warriors and Odin, if I'm not mistaken. But as the three roosters chime off, the, uh, the giants come with different groups like you have this group of giants with this group of dead and then you have like the unrighteous dead and the the um the giants from the south with sir and he is a fire giant from the south and we've had that discussion in the last one you yeah. know that 
was actually uh, that maybe maybe their directions were literal, you know. And if you look at where that tail was originated, where it stemmed from Germany in that in that area of uh, you know northern Germany, where it branched out from, that's uh, a good north, south, east, and west point to break it down from. And you can see which country is in just about every direction. And I think when we're talking about it, CERT is the fire giant from the south or the black giant. And if you look from that area, you have like Italy, Sardinia, Africa, um, the, um, oh, what is the name of that other area? Cappadocia? Yeah. Where is the, not, not, Cap, not Cappadocia, um, where the, the Temple of Baalbek is. Oh, um, just Asia Minor, basically. Lebanon, Turkey, Syria. Lebanon, in that area. But yeah. that's, I think it's very, uh, very literal. Are, are you yeah. familiar with the um, cave song? And uh, the, there's a um, short Norse, Norse tale called Cave Song, at least in my language. Uh, and it's about the Danish king acquiring two uh, female slaves. And they are literal giants. Uh, and he puts them to work with um, with grinding millstones together, and they, they're able to grind riches, and, and they keep grinding, keep grinding, and they, they create a golden age out of these riches. Mm -hmm. So like there's a perpetual peace; no one is killing anyone, even if someone found their brother's murderer bound before them, uh, that person will, would not be killed. So it was like this, yeah, golden age created. Wow. But, but he abuses that gift, the, the Danish king. I, I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, and he, he keeps telling them to work and work and work. And uh, they get tired. <laughs> so at the end, they shatter the whole thing, the entire grindstone, and they unleash chaos again. Uh, and I find that very interesting that the giants are able to create a, a, a temporary golden age for Scandinavia because that's what the myth says. Uh, yeah. and, and that myth has been, um, has been uh, yeah, and they toss this grindstone into the ocean and, and it keeps turning. So um, that's why the oh. ocean is uh, so salty. <laughs> and this, oh, this, uh, this tale has uh, continued uh, in, in more modern, or not modern, but in fairy tales. So that there are uh, folklore tales about this uh, grindstone that creates salt in the ocean. Uh, yeah, but but it's, in those it's fairy interesting tales, that you're you're talking about like the grindstone, like you know, keep grinding in a, a circular motion, and from that coming a a golden age. You know, it, it's it's you, you could say that they're literally like grinding, cycling into yeah. a a golden yeah, yeah. age. Yeah, That's, like the it's, circular it's movement. It's interesting how. In like just so many ways and in so many tales, you'll find like references to cycles and, and the golden age. And um, going back a little to the uh, Tuatha Dé Danann and them supposedly coming from uh, from the north, I, I, I'd say Not that the Tuatha Dé Danann. Uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann are the, the tribe of Danu, the Tuath Dé. Oh. But clearly they're coming from the same i mean this they're talking about the same groups it's it's the grandfathers of the tuatha de Danann, basically yeah. oh that's that's interesting but uh them supposedly coming from the north like there are a lot of theories going around that it's not i mean we all know the out of africa theory is bunk. Oh, okay. like we we know by now that's like yeah maybe there was a cradle of humankind of civilization in Africa, but it was not the cradle. See, that's um, that's sorry, what sorry I believe. to everyone who uh, disagrees with that. Sorry to everyone who feels politically attacked now, but it's it's what we believe, and this is our I don't, podcast. We can speak freely. But it's also it, about it is, like where you draw your line, where the timeline begins, you know, because there's yeah, many yeah. cradles, you know, after many disasters. I think there are many cradles I, from many different races. That's too, I that can't too. Say that too. Their cradle of life theory completely bunk. I just think it doesn't relate to every race. I think it, it fits perfectly for the race they're describing. 
I yeah. think it does not for the nomadic Germanic tribes and the Nordic tribes. I, I don't think they came from the same cradle. I mean, we have oh. tribes that we know came from the Caucasus Mountains, from the Mongolian Mountains, the and Caucasians. from the Negroid Mountains. So, so, I mean, that's that's where um, they got the, the names from. Isn't it interesting that uh, Europeans have the highest amount of uh, Neanderthal blood? Is it mm. li like four uh, percent? Yeah, and, especially and in Asians Europe have like, Europe, I believe. Oh. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. No, that that is interesting because they they tell us there are so many like ancestors. We have so many ancestors. Like it's not just the what is it like four or five that we got taught in in high school like there is now like between every there are like another three ancestors and they're pushing the timeline even the, the denisov shook that up when when we really found the denisovans when we found the proof of of solid denisovan evidence that's when it shook stuff up because not only did we find the proof of that we also found very skilled made jewelry that was like basically machine polished and metal that was gold, little gold rings hooked into a, a partial jade circle that was probably once part of a bigger ring. I mean, it was like really fine machine stuff. And this is with a race of people that was... 12 to 16 feet tall in the upper mountains of russia hmm. now we're also, finding also there. wolf cave have you guys heard of the wolf cave in sweden no no do yeah. tell it's in kristinestad um it's near finland um the upper part uh like it's so it's like this cave that they found and the speculation is that the tools found would uh be Neanderthals, like the, the oldest known Neanderthals at like 120,000 to 130,000 years ago in this in these Nordic countries. So that's a huge indication of these older civilizations as well. These gods. Interesting that you mentioned that timeline, because I remember something. There is this um, creator, this archaeologist that I uh, follow on YouTube, Mini Minute Man. He's got a fucked up name but um he has a video on a hundred and thirty thousand year old mastodon kill in uh north america and besides just the mastodon remains they found human remains um as well and like um just weapon injuries like, like cuts in the bone of that mastodon and um supposedly that pushes the timeline for like humans arriving in north america or just being in north america pushes it back like another couple ten thousand years and there are so many <laughs> things found that push the timeline just so far back and I i'm not just talking like everybody thinks that neanderthal like huh they're basic cavemen you know like big skull little brain just yeah. all broad no brain no they were they, they had a bigger brain than us yeah again yeah. it's more propaganda it's the same yeah. same stuff from from book of enoch it's <laughs> it's that whole you should hate them uh that's why it's okay to go find them and kill them you know like it goes goes to north america the mound builders were slaughtered by the natives so when when the vikings showed back up again <laughs> you know they were reclaiming their ancestral soil it was, I don't know, man. Politics, no, politics, and history like don't it. mix. We we ended the We're last podcast mix. on that note that we were talking about the giants sinking back into the earth. Yeah, and yeah. he's talking about the mound builders, and I think that that is the cycle. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We have we have the something happening where everybody is basically chased off into the caves. Yeah, who's well, going to survive? But the biggest, the strongest, and the baddest, right? Yep. So eventually, you're going to wind up with this race of alpha males again through selective breeding, right? Exactly. But then a couple more decades go by in the cave system, and then you have people starting to come out again, right? 
now you have people that have been out of the caves. Like we wind up with this broken culture, right? Like we have people that are currently living in primitive states still to this day in a, in a world of technology and information, right? Because their tribe has been living that way for millennia and they are going to continue. Now, those people will probably be, if a, a, a something happens, they'll be the first one up into the caves and the first ones back out because they're the most comfortable with their native area. They, they know how to farm. You know what I mean? They know everything that they're looking for. The people that manage to survive that are chased up into the caves that are not native to those areas, they may be able to dominate for a little while and steal food and get by that way and, and maybe make it. But then you wind up with this breakdown again where you have the worst part of humanity surviving. And, you know, that that's basically where we're at. And at the end of the cycle, it says, you know, you have a breakdown where the moral end of humanity just shatters. Yeah. Yeah. And I still think, sorry, go ahead. I still think that there's a, there's a contingent, a very large contingent that is in inner earth. I think there are multiple factions within inner earth uh, that emerge after, because uh, the cataclysms would be different there. So, and I think that these these people act as missionaries that emerge after a uh, cataclysm on the surface, and uh, the like like the story goes like I think uh, Odin Krishna uh, that these were actual historical figures that came and distributed new knowledge to people. I think uh, wherever you go, I mean, look at look at the Hopi Indians, and they talk about the ant men. <laughs> that that brought him out of the caves you know after the end you know kept him safe and sheltered and then pulled him out and uh, i think that there are these these contingencies uh of people these different factions that even might war i mean if you if you look into some of the old middle ages uh, ufo accounts there's some real interesting stuff about like battles happening over Munich, you know, <laughs> real wild yeah, accounts, yeah. like things happening in the sky. And they're like, oh, angels and demons are fighting. But I think it's these contingencies that uh, come out and try to teach man to be, you know, OK, this time, maybe don't be such an asshole. And, uh, you know, let me let me help you. And then we eventually just just like it always goes, you, <laughs> you kill off all the uh, missionaries. And there you go. <laughs> It also kind yeah. of seems like we have a like a return of the king kind of situation within the cycle, like you know Joseph yeah. Campbell's heroes heroes adventure, where like this like you know the more natural, the more obviously you know the pagan heathen way is like the underdog in our society. Oh, it has been for as long, even those who like are Catholic and accept that and kind of know history, but are still Catholic, even though they know what the Catholics did. It's like, yeah. it still just perpetuates, you know, they're the underdog, but then there's this archaic revival. McKenna has been talking about it. Like, so it's coming up. This, this cycle is turning over as, as we were talking about before. And it's like the return of the, the, the savior return of the King return of all of it. Yeah. It's this story that just kind of continues over and over into like a never ending story. I and it is the... interesting that Tolkien was obsessed with Finnish folklore and grammar and after he learned about things like the box saga possibly that's what we think uh he wrote his first elven language i i call it the the rising of the black sun or the return of the mm -hmm. goddess or the transition into you know the golden age which you know the greeks talked about the need for there to be this this uh, catalyst age that would that would go from the age of iron to the golden age and to begin the cycle over again uh this Alchemy. is like the yuga of heroes uh that's mm -hmm. that's what i think yeah, the, the that, that we're in cycle. right now yeah no that's 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 exactly why i um i'm, I'm happy to have this a physical copy of uh, oh, great Fola, revolt against the modern world uh i have it on audiobook too it's just it's much easier i can just listen on the go and whatever but uh, I, I purposefully uh, opened it on the um, chapter 28, the cycles of decadence and the heroic yes. cycle. Yes. Because I thought it would be so incredibly relevant for this because it is indeed talking, you know, uh, about, the, about the Greeks and um, 
let's see, yeah, talking about the Nephilim, the primordial, powerful, and divine race of androgynous beings may be related with the period in which the Nephilim were men of renown. It is the race of the Golden Age, you know? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, the box saga also kind of relates this Nephilim story where like at one point we have this breaking away from the North and in, according to the box saga, they talk about the Dan line and the Sven line creating the, uh, the, you know, all the kingdoms after the North. And, um, uh, I kind of lost my place there for a second. I'm sorry, guys. Um, don't worry. We got but the, the the Greek historian I think called Herodotus. He mm -hmm. speaks about uh, this um, uh, Tula population, mm, yes. uh, and then they claim he claimed that they claim uh, that they are descended from the trees, and that's obviously uh, the same as the Norse mm. thought about themselves. Oh uh, yeah, the Nephilim, the Nephilim story, right? Yeah, yeah. We have these uh, gods from the north coming down and mating with the daughters of man it's like kind of i've also related it to like the romeo and juliet story yeah. as well because it's a it's a archetype that plays out and th this whole fall is is kind of described in christianity and catholicism is is just a, a reflection of this old world being kind of like mingled into the new world it was really interesting to look at it like that like the the fall of lucifer even you can look at it like this i had a different perspective on this this blood mingling Mm. Uh, I was I was considering uh, the possibility that, say, Atlantis or Hyperborea were to crash, and you're trying to give knowledge to these uh, these people that don't know any of the stuff that you know. What's the quickest way you can do that? Straight through blood. You you give your blood in this way, and your offspring are now one step closer to you they're they're practically you at this point mm. if you're if we're tracing it down through the paternal line then this is this is a massive key in um and i think uh human genetics and that's why there is a lot of messing with the blood going on exactly that's why like the the, the whole you know jab thing i don't want to get too far into that that's that's all politics i don't do politics it's everyone knows that anyway exactly but like it wasn't we all know that it doesn't cure shit it doesn't stop shit but what it um what it does is it messes up um your blood it messes up your arteries like so many um coroners now finding um oh shit what are they Fibrous called tissue. again uh, bl uh, blood clots blood clots just huge blood clots sometimes just like literally in the whole artery is just yeah. one blood clot like you know several feet long and, and they're fibrous that's the other thing is yeah these are like long fibers of something in the uh, bloodstream which they're pulling out and I, I have to ask, has anyone ever like read through Robert E. Howard's uh, Conan stories? I have. Oh, I yes. was going to ask you guys about that. All right, because it, it, bringing up the uh, the civilization uh -oh. aspect of things. And uh, Josh, I think your uh, speakers are feeding back again. I could definitely hear myself over them. But um, with with Conan primarily following him, um. Conan what was not, you know, it, it didn't turn out like the movie. He just left his tribe at something like 15 years old. By the time he was 17 is when uh, his adventures really began. And he was, uh, he was a, a pretty good hulk of a beast even then. He only got bigger as, as, the, as time went on and more stories came out. But what Conan does, what he illustrates... He has a disdain for society unless it benefits him. And you can tell even in the stories where he's king and he, he rules over this um he rules over this kingdom of uh, Aquilonium. Yeah, you know, he's he's very fair. He's uh, in fact he, he 
very much rules always on the side of his people. He doesn't abuse power. He's not interested in it. The one thing that bothers him is he is not out there adventuring. He's not out there in the in the rocks. He's not out there in the forest. He's not out there in the elements. And, and you can you can tell it doesn't sit well with him because he's constantly lamenting this. He does not like civilization because civilization always and forever it has to be protected by rough hard people and once you turn against those rough hard people who are protecting your civilization you descend into degeneracy you descend into decadence once that happens and everybody's too fat lazy and um otherwise just you know self-absorbed shall we say to defend the civilization then here come the barbarians, and the, by the time they're at the gate, it's too late, you're overrun, and now everyone's enslaved. Over time, until someone either A fights back, or the barbarism is now integrated into that civilization, can the whole cycle begin again? And we're talking about Ragnarok, and we're looking at cycles. This is the big cycle that Howard talks about. And Howard grew up in a time where the stories of the Wild West were, were like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I'm only about maybe a generation or two removed from that, that kind of thing. Because I've told this story before about uh, my great-grandfather. Um, to, to cut it short, my great-grandfather had been shot in the back by another man. And back then, you could shoot a man dead get your horse and a little bit of gear, ride 50 miles into the next town, no one knew who you were. You could tell, you could tell them whatever you want. No one was checking IDs. So this guy shot my great-grandfather in the back. My great-grandfather survived, but he, he was disabled from it. So at the tender young age of 12, he buys my grandfather his first revolver and his first rifle. Every morning, gets him up on a horse, takes him for a ride, shoot that shoot the top of that fence post shoot that knot hole in that tree and over time my grandfather gets better at shooting by the time he's about 18 he purchases one of the first pump action shotguns on the market 19 years old there's a knock at the door uh he and my great-grandfather get up they answer the door there's a woman there telling my great-grandfather the man who shot you is back in town we've all seen him and so my grandfather goes to make sure he stays where he is and my great-grandfather tells him don't let him put, don't let him you know aim that rifle at you he will kill you well grandfather's over there he's knocking at this this guy's door finally this woman answers telling him over and over he's not here he sees movement just over her shoulder moves her out the way whips his uh, shotgun up and fires from there, he just hauls ass. He goes and he finds the constable and my great grandfather. They go back. My grand, my great, my grandfather had killed this guy, like just literally shot him dead. And the constable looks, brings my great grandfather over, says, "Is this the man who shot you?" He says, "Yep." He positively identifies him, and he says, "Okay, well, it's a it's a self defense shooting, you know, because hey, his rifle was right there in his hand. He was he was about to." <laughs> He was about to take me off the census prematurely here. So imagine living in a time like that, where if that were to occur today, suddenly, you know, uh, my great grandfather probably would have been painted as he deserved it. What was he doing around that guy? And oh, my grandfather's now a murderer. You know, that, that's the kind of attitudes that that the slow decline has actually generated to this point. And we could see that complete degeneration from, you know, from having heroes, from having those ideals and things to look up to. You know, He-Man, Thundercats, X-Men, Superman, so on and so forth, to now that's all toxic masculinity. You know, the, the ladies can't even have she rock anymore because well that's toxic that that's um uh, you know that that's that's something males gave you and honestly now, i can now see we have the, she hulk oh <laughs> the show about nothing oh. yeah exactly i mean seinfeld was a show about nothing but they made it work right 
Well, you knew they were self-centered from the start. I mean, every yeah. character in there was self-centered, and they <laughs> let you know that, and they, they made it kind of comical. This makes it, uh, it I mean, if you're going to base your civilization on what you see there, um, it's gone <laughs> from the the, nar- the comically narcissistic to the cringe narcissistic, the self-absorbed, yeah. the complete degeneration. I'm saying it now, it... it it's probably not long before the barbarians are at the gate and there are going to be very precious few to stand up. And those precious few who will stand up, mark my words, will absolutely be demonized for standing up. Like, there's nothing... Oh, we're, we're demonized already are. standing up already. Yeah. That's already happened. I mean... It's been happened. It's a, it's a slow burn. But but watch what happens when that precious few actually stands and says, no, you're not going to come in and just take our neighborhoods. You're not going to take this. You're not going to take that. I don't care what you think you're entitled to. This is mine. I worked for it. I paid for it. You're not getting it. When they, when they fight back, when they push back, demonization is only going to get worse. And the whole point of that kind of propaganda is not... I mean, these people, they know they're hypocrites. Yeah. And they don't care if they're hypocrites. Right. What they just hope you to, believe it. <laughs> right. What they're trying to do is... Hypocrisy is a feature. It, exactly. It's a demoralization campaign. Absolutely. Dude, I'm actually working on a, a book about exactly this, the, the fall and resurrection of the hero. This is uh, the whole topic of my study the, the last couple of years. Has <laughs> been exactly this, because I think it is the the most important thing, and this is the age where it is it's make it's going to make a comeback. And you know, if you start getting into Nietzsche, uh, I don't know how you guys feel about Nietzsche, but he uh, he goes on and on about how the underman exists for a purpose, and the purpose of the underman is not. Uh, you know, to, to take power, but, you know, as mediocrity rises, it, it becomes a platform for the overman to build himself off of and step off of, uh, like they serve the overman without even knowing it. And the rise of the overman is the fault of the underman. Um, and I think that this is, this is a big part of what's happening. If you, if you notice going back to, uh, going back to somebody brought up Lucifer earlier, if you, you know, go back to Catholicism and look at the inclusion of Lucifer into uh, the the Vulgate. It it doesn't even belong there. <clears throat> it was just two monks having a beef, and you know, one of them just decided he was going to rename this portion of the Bible that he was got stuck translating. That he was just going to throw the word Lucifer in there to demonize Bishop Lucifer because Bishop Jerome was, uh, you know, let me. Let me just tell you, he spoke Hebrew fluently and he uh, did the translation in uh, Bethlehem. So you can you can make whatever insinuations you want at that point. But he uh, was very keen on the idea that, you know, Bishop Lucifer was was this terrible person because he didn't want these uh, uh, these groups that had declared Jesus to not be uh, divine, which is like huge and breaking with uh with catholicism and if you again there's a certain tribe that is constantly trying to push forward this idea um and uh so it's it was sort of funny how you wind up with the very what what i see in this age is the very first subversion which is which is the flipping upside down and then twisting uh of of the the subject so that the subject can't be recognized as what it originally was. This is the first subversion of the hero within uh, Christianity that I that I've seen. And so, what I what I kind of think is happening here is for the last couple thousand years, the hero, the internal archetype of the hero with a capital H, has been subverted within the culture itself. So that the yep. hero uh, is becomes like what do we see in cinema now? It's all it's all anti heroes. It's all uh, a hero is somebody who just hasn't fallen yet. You know, it's, it's always just a matter of time before they screw up and become the villain. And uh, you know, oh yeah, we could always feel for him. Like they took Thanos uh, and and turned him into some sort of sympathetic villain 
which you, you can't even have a proper villain these days. But the hero itself is is a very similar concept where the entire point of what this this uh, archetype is is now lost. It was it, it's done in per- on purpose over and over and over. You see it in Luke Skywalker. You see it yeah. in like like just just name it. You, you guys you guys have the examples. But I think that the entire motivation of this is because these archetypes are internal. And when it comes time for you to act out of the hero side of you, you like you, you, a uh, bear comes to your door, and all of a sudden you uh, uh, have the need to draw on that inner archetype of the hero. When you go and reach for it and you pull it out of you and you act out of it, that hero now is just a complete subverted monster who's just gonna, he's gonna lose his family and then cry about it for the next 50 years because he didn't do shit, you know? And that's, that's what the, subversion of the internal archetype has become it's what it's led to but the black sun is rising man that's this stuff it can be undone and i've i've like witnessed it with many people as well as myself that you can take a coward and show him what it is to be an actual hero give him something to aspire to again uh yeah i I think that we're in the uh... time of it because there are three stages that Nietzsche uh, points out to the overman, uh, if you know what those are. Uh, there is uh, the first stage is the camel, which is constantly burdened. Everyone p- puts burdens on him. Uh, and then the second stage is the lion, uh, which takes revenge, violent revenge, mm-hmm. uh, lashes out. Uh, and the third stage is the child. Uh, and the child is unburdened by the past so he's kind of uh, won against the past it's just forgotten yeah. uh, so it's uh, an interesting metaphor uh, and it's ki- it like it's philosophy but it's kind of related to the old myths as well Very because much. you have this uh, rebirth aspect yeah. uh, so so after after you have taken revenge because you have to <laughs> you have to lash out in, yep. in a sense, at least, you're supposed to just forget about it, or because otherwise you will be burdened by this resentment, this feeling of resentment and inferiority, and yeah. So, so it's very important. Even if you have an enemy, you're not supposed to feel inferior to him, uh, or or chain yourself to revenge like in the book uh, Moby Dick for instance you, you, where you don't accept reality or you don't accept what has happened to you uh, Ahab, uh, Ahab having to have that whale yeah yeah. Uh, I mean um, Moby Dick is uh, an American American myth American modern myth I would mm-hmm. say but it's very very rich well, yeah, having like, vengeance is one has... thing being blinded by it is another yeah and you know look at who the heroes are nowadays you know they're politicians who stand up against you know the the old guard they are a-list actors they are the front man of your favorite band they are a fucking famous fucking rapper you know those are the new heroes, you know, they're not people who have done great deeds. They're just people that are, well, famous, basically. Nowadays, they're shock value artists. That's because yeah. that's basically all it's become. Society has become this look at the next shock value artist. And it, yeah, it, what's, it, what's the shiny I mean, new thing? What's the shiny new toy? What's What's the next... And like it's, on the on the other hand, what's the next thing that we can be outraged about? Like we yeah. went from Kuf to Ukraine, and now I believe we have traded in Ukraine for Iran. Well, look uh, at like how I, the... I, I, can't, I can't keep track anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I gave up. I gave up because like my mind is too beautiful a place to fill it with things like this but when you when you think about uh, the former US presidency, Right. The whole thing is engineered to be exactly this, the establishment of a true hero. And then the rug gets pulled out and and the whole thing is revealed for what it really is. 
and and everyone is left going no that can't it can't be uh or or they just jump straight to this abandonment of any idea of heroism itself and i think that that's the entire point of it all that's why i pick some of some of the worst heroes so that you know in having these things and by by pushing these things these these topics you wind up confronting people with the very fact that they're afraid of heroes themselves that they they they're afraid to even have one and the fact that i have ones that they see are terrible is just part of the the spell breaking maneuver it's it's kind of it's kind of a, incredible the way it all works out because they've rejected the very concept of the hero that the hero cannot exist uh they they think that if the thing uh there's there's a certain group now that's obsessed with simulation theory and they've like taken it to the next level they've taken off with it and um, i at, love these guys but sorry go on look at the, whole, the whole world economic forum plan is based on simulation Oh, yeah. Everything yes. the World Economic Forum does is a simulation exercise. It's yeah. all like, mimicry of consciousness. Yeah, it's you, all mimicry of the you, natural process. The you can get a WEF video and watch the new videos that pop up on their YouTube page, and within three days, you will see what was in their videos in the news headlines. Yep, like their uh, the economics of water video pops up. Next thing you know, Lake Mead's going dry, Colorado River's going down, you know, all of a sudden the economics of water become a big thing, you know, like a week later. Um, the new one, they have their new video up now is about erasing the borders in between Canada and the United States and the Mexico and the United States and making one what they call mega nation out of it. Yeah, they've been know. talking about Why that. They do that with Israel. That's a great idea. Why, you why, guys, why do these assholes in Switzerland care? Do you what guys remember the Zeitgeist that came out yeah. in like 2006? Yeah, they were yeah. talking about that. The um, like they were talking about rolling out the Amero, which obviously that's not going to exist because of all this crypto digital no currency that everyone's getting Tell hooked me, on. Maybe it will exist me, as a crypto, uh, as a crypto coin, because mm. like we're we're now going into uh, like there is indeed like a fake simulation going on. Um, I, I've heard it called the Eighth Sphere too. Um, New Agers like that. I don't. I don't know about that. Okay. Um, it's almost like, more of a play than a simulation. The whole I think that's a better way to frame it. <laughs> the whole yeah. world is a stage, and politicians see? are just ugly ass actors who didn't make it <laughs> in Hollywood or like whatever the the, the hot spot for actors and acting of your country is. But we're going into uh, like they want to merge us with technology so bad Nietzsche predicted that philip k he dick. said it many, will happen many did philip k dick's series electric dreams yeah. episode 10 called <laughs> kill all others if you look exactly what they're doing there everybody's got a screen in their face they're not bothering to look up because they're watching the next politician in it that in their every speech they put out is the next big thing and everybody's got their face buried in their phones they put these watches yeah. on them that dope them up with cortisol and all this other stuff, right? But if you look at the deeper elements of, of that episode, it's exactly what the WEF is talking about now, about merging the borders. I don't think Philip K. Dick was an author. I think he was a prophet and he didn't realize it oh. because so much of his writing has just materialized over time in well, real life. That's that's the thing. I think that that all of this reality is a metaphor playing itself out mm -hmm. including my own place in it that i am a living walking breathing metaphor yeah uh, i don't a know description what that's of for. what is yeah like uh i don't know if you guys dabble in psychedelics but i did yep. a long time ago and I, got, I went real deep and yeah this is kind of what a couple of friends and i would always come to is like you'd come to this place in the trip where you'd just be constantly saying things like it's like this it's like that yeah. or yeah. it's as if this and we notice after a while of like hours of doing this it's like are we describing life are we describing earth are we describing consciousness in us and wh why can't we say what it is? We can only describe it. And that took me down like a further rabbit hole, you know, for years about this thing. The, the, everything we see is just a representation of yes. something that we don't see. And usually it's, you know, emanating from within is the most 
that's like the closest thing we humans could come up with i think emanating within, from within so as within so without these concepts exactly. are the closest truths you're going to get because of course when the human comes back from these ecstatic experiences of all different kinds doesn't have to be psychedelics but you have to use that right brain logical thinking mind that needs answers and needs everything to fit in a cookie cutter. But you're talking about Pandora's box here. You're talking about something that doesn't fit inside the appearance. It's like biting your own teeth. So it's, it's a weird conundrum that we're in. We're not really ever seeing reality ever. You're, I mean, man. you're merging your right brain and your left brain. And those right. are two parts of yourself that exist on the same plane at the same time. You have your logical thinking, you, your yourself, your being, your set of morals, your lived experiences and the triggers from them and all of that, your vocabulary, that's all in your, your logic center. Right. Then you have what I call your, your, your spirit side, your creative side, your antenna, right? This is your connection to not just your own creative spark, but also your your antenna to 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 receive you know what i mean from Absolutely. being from the runes the gods the, the vibrations from the earth for christ's sake the schumann resonance you no know, um whatever whatever people are are going through nowadays that's shaking them away from their cores or putting a faraday cage around them with a power grid and a, a tin roof on their house and it's just blocking out every piece of the environment that they need to absorb to heal properly and to bond with the earth and the the others right so now you've created this group of people that have separated themselves and they've purposely otherized themselves to the point where now they're a mass and they're looking at the rest of us pointing back going now they're the others mm -hmm. right and it's it's this horrible pendulum that's been swinging back and forth Eventually, this pendulum's either going to hit a wall or the chain's going to break and it's going to come skidding out. And Dude, let's remember, uh -oh. Samson, let's take it right back to the beginning that we were talking about these groups, these these two groups, like the the crow being on top and the and the you know the falcon being underneath and all that, the eagle versus serpent. Like these are those two polarities that exist within <laughs> and they're externalized. I have uh, a friend now. Uh, please go check out Old World Florida on YouTube. My friend, Doctor Narco Longo. He was recently on a on a roundtable we did. He ties a lot of crazy stuff from Florida into these viking stories that i like to talk about and get into so that's really crazy but yeah he was talking about it from an astrological point of view and kind of pointing to the jupiter people versus the poseidon type people the neptune people the neptune of the sea versus jupiter of the sky and you have these and all of these tales that we look into from the the, the atlantis myths or these seafaring people it's all this same symbolism and you even have ea of acadia who is who's enki it's the same yes. it's clearly enki represented as a fish many times and like th these symbols keep coming back mm -hmm. desperately trying hammering us until we understand this really completely different way to look at language and find out what these symbols really mean. And it's really pointing us further and further back, as you were saying before, about how just the timeline keeps going further and further back. And we learn more about ourselves in the collective history that we have than we ever will from the history books and anything that's being pushed on us. And that's purposeful as well on so many levels, not to hold a nation together. I think many are on that level and they, they think they're upholding a nation by keeping those kinds of secrets, but they're compartmentalized, right? Everything's compartmentalized. Whoever's at the top, quote unquote, I don't even know if they're aware completely other than one part of this whole thing, you know, it's all fractal. Well, you guys I remember, we, sorry. We look at the, everybody's, you know, talking about homesteading now, right? We've got right. to get back to our roots. We've got a homestead. And that is great, dude. It, people do. People really need to learn those skills again, building the biome levels up in the soils. I mean, just be, becoming real organic eaters, you know, not like people that are putting Monsanto chemicals on their soil and growing their own vegetables in their backyard and using <laughs> Roundup and all this other stuff. But I mean, like real back to the folk way, fertilizing, using your chicken waste, you know what I mean? The whole nine, right? But that's only going to take us so far. You know, that'll, that'll create little pockets of survivors. But if something like a new Ragnarok is to happen, 
that that will that will teach people. It will get people a kickstart on it. But those people are going to be the ones that say, okay, come to where my homestead is and you can set your farm up on this side of me yeah. and you need to set your farm up over here because communities of homesteaders that are close by each other is what we need. They offer security. They offer you know, the ability to trade with your neighbor for things you don't have or skills that you lack that they possess. You know what I mean? It, it allows you to for be... a dip and take to, to, to build a, a new reservation a new tribe of men that's willing to break away from the bs that's going on you know and i mean this is this is what's going to save certain people when the new ragnarok does happen and you know in tabletop role-playing circles right now we can see like many of the subjects we've discussed are right there they're very evident in front of us uh the destruction of the hero being one of them because um D &D fifth edition that that core set of rules there's really nothing wrong with it. it it's serviceable if anyone picked them up they could they could begin homebrewing their own campaigns and stuff like that and that's all great uh the first several adventure books that were published for that rule set were okay they, they weren't anything earth shattering but they were okay and now you see more of this you, you can see the, the marxism creep the modernity creep into it. Um, just to give you two shining examples of it, uh, number one was Strixhaven, which there were proms. This is a wizarding school. There are proms. You can work as a barista in the, in a coffee shop. God. I'm like, oh, <laughs> what the absolute <laughs> is this? There was uh, the Sims and added it in. Oh, uh, <laughs> they then they republished Spelljammer. Which, if you're not familiar with that, that's D and D in space. That's been a thing since the second edition. It's basically like big ships in space, not like you know starships, but like big sailing ships in space. And they copied and pasted a race called the Hadozi, and then modified them to make them a former slave race who enjoy work. And it, it, it was the most ridiculous <laughs> thing you've ever seen. But they had, like, the, the ship to ship combat wasn't really a thing. You basically had to hack that in yourself. And I was, and, and there was a big, you know, shit stick kicked up over that. Then there was Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel. And its selling point was that it was all people of color who wrote it. And, oh, God. Don't worry, I am going somewhere with that, and you are not going to like it, not one bit. Okay, so we all know that Netflix has the series Edge Runners out now. The trailer looked amazing. I went, oh, fuck me, I really wish they'd lower their rate so I could actually watch this thing. I mean, it, look, it looked awesome. I was, I was, I mean, I bought in the minute I saw it. I was like, geez, this, this is great. I'll check out the memes later. Yeah, well, there yep. will be memes. <laughs> Oh, I bet that's put, that's how. Put a that's picture of Daniel Day stuff. Lewis. Someone superimposed Daniel Day Lewis's face right here. And just put, <laughs> there will be memes. I'll, I'll try and do it and post that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, there has been a recent push to put edge runners, the, these people who literally plug into the net, and they they manipulate it like you would manipulating running around in the real because that's the way cyberspace looks to them. That's the way they experience it. This is not just ones and zeros in code. This is, they plug in and it's it's like the matrix almost. Like yeah, they're in the say, so, sounds exactly. like a matrix 2.0. Right, it's Cyberverse. Just, just like the metaverse in the uh, in Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash to an extent. But they wanna take that and bring that into D&D, &D. not apply fifth edition rules so that you can play this group they want to put them into DD. &D. this will make them as useless as tits on a board because these are these are technology dependent characters if you put them into DD, they're going to get they're going to get smashed there's there's no good way to do that and unless so, you say DD is a giant simulation <laughs> right oh. it, which it's not going to make much sense to the to the characters that are in nope. there you know, that barbarian sees somebody streaking through like the flash and he's going to wonder what sorcery is this. 
Is that Neo? You know? and he's Whoa. not even gonna want. He, he's not gonna know who the fuck Neo is. He all he's gonna know is I must kill. You know that's it. So now that you have that in mind, let's go back to Journeys to the Radiant Citadel for just a moment because oh, we're we're supposed to be celebrating people of color writing a book, not people with any artistic ability, not people with writing ability, not people who can coherently put together a game, and it is flooded with Marxism that just does not make sense at all. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be a big utopia. And it's just out of, you know, it's off in its own little plane. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, so were the writers. But now they want to take characters from a game. And we have discussed this game before in the tribe chat. Uh, Mike Pondsmith is the creator of this game. He's also the creator of Artel Sorian Games. Artel Sorian Games works hand in hand with CD, CD Project Red. This man has built this M, uh, sort of an empire. 20, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 was a video game that just hit win uh, last year, maybe, I think. Three years ago now, actually. Yeah. Three years ago. Okay. Oh, yeah. So Damn. that's been a thing for three years. Oh. It, the memes going around that are still awesome. By the way, uh, it's, it's, kind of it's getting new life. Actually, yeah, it, it is. It's getting new life because of the series. And here's the kicker. Mike Pondsmith is a man of color. Yep. And now you've got these people who are writing for d and d. it this it's so pathetic because now they're like, well, we're a thing too. It's like, well, then make something else. And now yeah. they've got these people, they, they just bought into it, like, immediately. And we're like, no, there is a tabletop role-playing game. In fact, there are several. There are several core rule sets to this, and they've been updated as time goes on. 2020 was written back in, uh, published back in 1988. And Cyberpunk Red is the new one. There is about to be a supplement which will tie Cyberpunk Red to 2077. That's about to come out. So yes, it's entirely possible to play edge runners by just playing that game. Wow. And not only that, you're supporting a man of color who made bold predictions. I, I say bold predictions. He created this alternate universe. But the problem is many of his alternate universe theories came true. And it, it's... Yeah, really, I remember you talking about this. Exactly. I yeah. showed them that video by Paul Joseph Watson and I, a, a couple others that I went, does, does this look familiar to anyone? Because it should. A lot of it should. A lot of it should be very frightening how in, in just like, what, 30 years, a lot of this just happened. It's almost like mm -hmm. someone took this and made it into an instruction manual. For Dude, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, Blade Great Runner, world. Electric yeah. trains. Do, do Android dream of electric sheep? It's all falling into niches right now. Like yeah, uh, how about that new game that <clears throat> that new Russian game that's coming out, the Atomic Heart? That looks very interesting with like the themes going on in there, pandemics and lockdowns and totalitarian police states and cyberspace, all kinds mm -hmm. of shit. It looks, hey, it's just vendetta. more of the same. But you know, twenty seventy seven trying dude. to normalize it. Before 2077 in particular, man, I really think that that's that is a very close, close hit to home. Like, I feel as though there will be us on the outskirts just without and having to survive on our own. Yeah. But there will be these mega cities. The mega cities are one of the biggest things I think that CD Projekt Red has, has kind of, quote unquote, just accidentally done coincidentally. Right. But the mega cities are exactly the infrastructure that they're planning for the future. You know, these live in work all the time. You know, they're, you're, you're getting these companies are getting paid by you existing at that level. You know, live in a pod. Well, bugs. it's yeah. and see, that's and the thing. Yeah, it, there used to be a standard where you would work and you would come home and just for that work, you would have a house and maybe some utilities and a belly full of food and you were satisfied. Right. But now this shrinkflation thing is happening and people are being told that they need a smaller house, but they need a bigger digital environment. Right. And I, I think this, this inverse influx is going to happen 
where they, you are going to have a whole bunch of people that plug into the metaverse and don't unplug. It's you all know? it's all based on this Ragnarok, this cycle, because of the trauma that some know we will be facing in in these times and have before. And what comes out of that, those hard times are generation after generation after generation of horrible mentalities and and lives and including the creation of sociopathy and psychopathy and i think that's where we're at we're being preyed on by those that have taken the collective trauma and you know externalized it in that way now let me let me build off what you were saying because mm. while, while i was taking my uh potty break there i did something came to mind and i had to run and grab my uh, kindle because I have this book and I'm going to say this in certain circles, you just don't mention the name Galina Kraskova. She triggers people. And I'm about to show you why she triggers people because I've read her book, uh, a modern, was it a modern guide to heathenry? Yeah. Mm. And this book, in my opinion, is one of the absolute best books written modern day on the subject of heathenry. And one of the things that she says is, this is, and I'm going to uh, read this, so get ready. I mean, strap in. This is going to get real heavy in just a second. Our capacity for thought allows us to decide cleanly, to turn our lives to our gods, to make choices about how we will live in the world and what kind of person we shall become, what kind of world to create. There is tremendous beauty and profundity in the way we were designed and the power of our minds to reach out to the gods and experience in some infinitesimal way all that they are. We connect with the mysteries of creation at every time we make a decision that aligns us with our gods and against entropy, which is what Ragnarok is. It is right. entropy on a grand scale. Against entropy, despair, and the empty promises of modernity, modernity, monotheism, and Marxism. In some respect, we are called to be co-creators with our gods, not that we have a hand in creating the world, but we can again and again align ourselves with the primordial acts of creation by aligning our minds and hearts and wills with that of our gods. Man, that was probably the best way to say that I've ever heard. Galena Kraskova might drop in mics all over. I'm going to need her name in writing and <laughs> so here, I can copy here's paste. The, here's the thing. I actually, the first yeah, time that. I even touched that book was an audio book through my Hoopla app. I was on my way home from work when I heard that part and I, I stopped. I'm like two, I, I literally live two blocks from where I work. I was halfway home. I stopped and went, wait, what? And I had to scrub back a little bit and it took me a minute to find it, but I listened to it again. And I'm standing still and consciously listening to this. And then I did it. I had to listen to this five times to make sure I was hearing this right. And I was like, oh, oh, holy crap. Okay. That one was, that was a bomb that was dropped. And, you know, she had already gone through the nine noble virtues. She, and she actually does admonish the reader a bit saying, how can you possibly uh say you're in favor of the gods how can you possibly uh you know subscribe to the way of heathenry if you don't lead a virtuous life if you don't you know conduct yes. yourself in a certain way and these are some of the best guides to do that and i was like okay yeah that makes sense now a little there's all now, none of us are perfect obviously there are some of us that will sit there and go, what? Come on, fuck off with all that. But And of course, I heard that little voice. I'm like, shh, take a theater row of seats, kid. Listen up. <laughs> and when she got to that part, that's why I was like, I get it now. I understand. I get why she pisses some people off. And I was a, I was actually a member of a group that when I brought up her as recommended reading, Ooh, that caused that that did not sit well with her. And what, I'm like, what doesn't why? sit well? If you if yeah, please t do tell. I'm a little out of my realm um, here. Let, let me just tell you about one uh, email exchange. Um, I, I won't mention names, but we did have someone who posted an email to the group uh, email, 
which then gets it's like an e list because one person posts to the group it gets distributed to everyone was, was and, it what you talked about in your last tea time stream yep no oh, this is gonna be fun and it was it was this program this little thing they wanted to do called interrogating whiteness now listen i have friends from all walks of life yeah, as long deep as share ex exactly that, like exactly that reaction. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, just, if you're yeah. if you're good with me, I'm good with you. <laughs> Absolutely. If, if you're a worth, if you just prove that you are an absolute piece of shit, I'm not going to associate with you. Yeah, uh, it's like something about you know contents of one's character. Yeah. I don't know. I heard it from some guy. Yeah, yeah does, does that, that still matter? matter? Something or other. It should, right? <laughs> <laughs> something or other. I don't do that anymore. Character, yeah. no, nah, man, that's secondary. Was, was we've was, abandoned the principle of struggle long ago. Was uh, was King part of that name? Because it seems <laughs> apt. It seems apt if it were. Yeah, but, See, but, just but, all, spoke, but anyway, spoke about I'm, equality, not equity. See, this right. new equity thing is a different thing altogether. It's a dragon, dude. It's gonna burn everything down. <laughs> that's it. So this email was a, was interrogating whiteness, and I'm looking at it going, one of our bylaws is that you don't discriminate based on skin color at all. That oh. should not go. <laughs> Obviously, that bylaw was very forgotten at a very convenient moment, at several convenient moments of that. Just slipped my so, mind. The, Oh darn! Well, we because it's okay that. to attack the white ones. That's exactly it. Yeah, you know, and, revenge stage. And there was all this. Well, we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. You see, and I'm like, mm, sounds Marxist. Do we? And I'm like, okay, this group said that they weren't political, and I was like, that's what I'm looking for. Everything on the brochure mm -hmm. looked great, so I joined, and then this this came in a couple months into my uh, membership here. And I'm looking at it, and uh, there's a website. Now, the one thing you just probably shouldn't have done is put the website up there because I'm going to go check it out. And I did. And I dug through it. And where does it end? Socialism, Marxism. Mm -hmm. oh, and I'm, of I'm like, every single I went, time. Oh, but we're not political and we don't discriminate based on skin color except where it's convenient. Yeah. And oh, if you're the voice of, if you try to be reasonable, and I, I was just kind of like, you know, we really don't need this. And, you know, what we've got going on is actually a pretty good thing. And I, tr of course, I tried to point that out. And that was where I first, I ran into the first wall of, that's not enough. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry. Wait, you're going to, shh. In the quiet words of the Virgin Mary, come again you know, all right great th quote this happened three <laughs> times and when the third time came i went you know what let's just say that i spend several months talking to a couple of people i get them to come to their senses they come out of things like the afa or some uh, actual yeah. neo-nazi camp let's just say i get them out of there now they have been warned about uh, that picture that you uh, posted, Stein, of uh, of uh, Wolf the Red. AFA, oh yeah, AFA has been leaning on that picture. Oh, that that guy. Yeah, yeah. sorry, they, I had to they, think for a moment. Yeah. Like, uh, just with all the I'm, pride I'm, flags I'm, hanging off of him. Um, no, I don't uh, really care. Gross. Like, I don't care that he supports that. That's that's his thing. I I have nothing to do with that. But Whatever. don't mix it with our faith don't mix it just yeah it, it it's, it's a subversion of the archetypes right you know? now one of the things that i i thought about and i thought about it very very long was if i bring these people out they're going to be in a state where they need a lot of gentle guidance and if i bring them to these people and they run into that that's not enough wall and I noticed it over the first, um, you know, the first gathering that I did, which was over an online Zoom call, they dismissed any concerns as conspiracy theories. Everything was circular logic. And then mm -hmm. I mean, there, there was some there was some good stuff that came out of it. Don't get me wrong. There was a, there was some good info I could glean from it. But when they start droning on about Nazi this, Nazi that, you're just like, oh, my God. It's a Nazi gaslighting thing. campaign. 
we're not political, but we're going to shove politics down your throat the whole time. Right. It's like, I mean, these it's also Nazis, ignorance. These Nazis of what you speak, are they in the room with you right now? <laughs> <laughs> show us on the oh. doll. Show, show Dude, us that's on the doll. Where did, where, did the, where did the mean mustache man hurt you? You know, yeah. you know just be class. All like, my young childhood years when I was learning everything. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I was born in a gas like, chamber. I yeah. Said, yeah. I criticized the She Hulk meme that came out the other day. Speaking oh. of, of pictures, right? That whole She Hulk thing with the incels, I shared that, made my little Whoa. comment about it. I got attacked from every angle. Oh, you must be yeah. an incel. You're an incel. You're an incel. And hey, it's like, is that all you can do is call That's me it. an incel? That's well, all there they is, have. There is even this new, there's this new movie that, uh, that came out. Um, I, I don't know the title exactly, but the uh the main character is supposedly uh based off of jordan peterson who is Kermit oh the yeah. A, yeah apparently yes. the king of incels like how is jordan peterson the king of incels like for real the, the dude he makes sense he talks yeah. he sense men. Well, and he i guess that's why, that's why people need to apologize that's Isn't why that, I don't... that uh that's that Jordan don't Peterson worry darling yeah yeah don't worry darling exactly yeah. well, which has been just... extremely purposely pushed in all of our faces as like these weird gossip controversies about the cast and shit obviously you just ignore them but it's obvious that they're being pushed at us very hard and it's really yeah, weird and it, yeah. it's it's set in like uh, like the the 1950s, you know, yeah. the, all the women are like stay at home women, and like all the men just go to work and whatever. And apparently, that's bad. Yeah, this is before motherhood because, was demonized. Because <laughs> the women now, they don't participate in the, the workforce and they don't do anything. Oh, it's so but sad. Like, that's the just funny make thing. That's the funny thing. Look at society back then. And the suicide rate and the level of happiness and satisfaction <laughs> in the so modern obvious. household, right? <laughs> the connection with the gods, the amount, the little amount that you had to work to possess an entire home and a car oh, yeah, and insurance yeah. and everything else that you needed, you know, like dad could go to work, mom could stay home, balance the family, right? Dude, nope. Medieval peasants worked 180 days a year. Yeah. <laughs> Medieval it, peasants. It, those were serfs. They were the yeah, serfs. serfs. Yeah. They, they were the lowest the class. Yeah, and yeah. it was because the church said that they need, uh, you know, they need that many days off to stay in connection with God and to, go, you know, to go to church and to stay religious and whatever. And we're talking Middle Ages. Like we are working now just like a hell of a lot more. Then medieval serfs working so hard to make it easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, listen, guys, this has been really, really awesome. I got to run. Speaking of family, I got to go do the dad thing. Oh, um, uh, yeah. It's, Enjoy. It's getting later here. Yeah. But this is awesome. And I was, it was really nice meeting all of you guys. Um, I hope to reach out to you guys and maybe we can connect more. I mean, on Absolutely, multiple man. shows. Absolutely, Who knows? Man. This was a really great time. Oh, so it was good to meet sure, everybody. Been it's been I'll great you having around. you. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. And uh, absolutely, anytime, but, man. All right, take it easy, guys. Okay, take it easy, bro. But uh, going I, going right back to it for just a just a moment. That when this came up, you know, the, the whole thought process was if I if I bring these people out of that, they're going to be in a state that they need gentle guidance. They don't need someone lecturing them. They don't need someone pounding them for every little thing they do. Because the minute that happens. They are hauling ass right back to where I found them. All my work gets negated now. How do you think I'm going to take that? Mm -hmm. Not well. Someone is getting grabbed by the throat, thrust against the wall, and told under no uncertain terms, if you ever do that again, you better be wearing fucking body armor. Do you understand me? Because <laughs> if you do it again, I'll take your fucking soul out. I will show it to you, and then I will can that son of a bitch. You know, that's the kind of reaction i would have because they these are the people that see violence and screaming and all these horrible traits as acceptable yep and if they're going to say that that's acceptable 
well, then you better better believe that if you think I'm on your side, that's going to be an acceptable uh, solution for me. Here's 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 a big question to this though, Raven. Mm-hmm. You, you have these idiots pushing for this socialist society, right? Mm-hmm. right? And I mean, they're they're going into people's workplaces and shaking it up and pushing these. They're technically communist, but we'll call it socialist for argument's sake, right? Um, I, it's it's you know, and it's all different shades of the same flapping flag. Um, it's water water but, down communism. When, when, when they push our world into this new automated socialist age, as they're saying, right? And they have this perfect equality between everybody. And everybody just sits at home while machines do all of their jobs. How the fuck are we going to earn anything? How are we going to have any satisfaction in our lives? You know what I mean? Like, there is an ultimate demise to that society. And it's the mental harm. Like that society, you'll wind up looking like Wally, the the freaking Disney movie, right? <laughs> yeah, Everybody no, literally exactly. But like, isn't that okay? Also, like that's why they're pushing for these, um, like these short bursts of happiness. You know, that's why they have to keep coming out with you know this new thing and that new thing and then this and then that. That's why, like. Also, that's why pop culture gets watered down so much and why Marvel, yes. like, uh, until, well, basically fucking eternity, they have a, a line of movies that they're going to bring out. You know, don't ask questions, just consume product and be excited <laughs> for next product. And they shit can well, the good like, ones. They shit can Deadpool 3. They shit can X-Force. They shit can a lot of the... Like all the ones I was looking forward yeah. to, they, they shit canned them. So I was just like, I don't give a fuck. And here's the key thing. And this is what I want to point out to a lot of you. Uh, tabletop RPGs, in my opinion, comic books, those things that we initially thought we could really do nothing about, that is the most fertile battleground we yes. can find because when they There's step there. into te- tabletop RPGs, they completely fucked up. And how they fucked up was if they had pulled this shit in the 90s, oh, they'd have won. Because what could I do but revert to my older D&D books, of which I did not have many, and then here's all this new shit. They pulled the rest from the shelves. Now here's all this new shit. Uh, but I think they would have like telegraphed their move way more than they would have now. But where they fucked up is self-publication has never been easier. People are kickstarting yeah. projects left and right. I know because I've kickstarted a few of them. And when those start rolling in, and they will be very soon, the Doom that came to Astrius is on its way with a companion cassette, no less. Yeah, yeah with, I, with I ordered comic it. books. Like, isn't it like, who is that? Like Eric July or who? who Eric is it? July, thank you. Yeah. yeah. With I saw oh, number one, he not to raise like four, what was it, four million, four point three million? Wow. And I mean, absolutely I believe he is, blew it out of the water. I believe he's Not printing the, at, as we speak. I believe he's yep. in the in the final stages of he's, actually um, publishing, of bringing bringing yep. it out. Yeah, people have already started receiving their copies. Um, yeah, yeah. Not to that, plug the shadow it. crown, but I mean, I I honestly think. When that is in its when in, when that's in a little bit further of a stage, that would make an amazing campaign RPG. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on, honestly, yeah, I think I think that would be that would be uh for, that's that's very fertile. Like like I talked about uh Basin before, which yeah. when I said I think we might have been beaten to the punch, but not quite. The well, research behind these folk monsters. That that's kind of sort of what I was going for, and that's why I put it on hold for now because I want to check this out. And I'm not mad about it. I'm excited because I'm seeing that I'm seeing uh, John Torres, the basic expert, working on on his Aztec game. I see um, Helvetia, which is the uh, the po- po- no Hungarian game that was based in Hungarian folklore and of course some of Grimm's fairy tales. I'm seeing that and I'm thinking, holy crap, you know, this is the absolute one thing I wanted. This is what I wanted to, I wanted to stir that up. 
And to have people just kind of independently come out on their own, it excites the hell out of me. I can't wait to see what they've done. Like, because isn't that what we talked about in our a, podcast on DND too? That it's it's a really good way of um, preserving the stories, preserving the heritage. It is yeah. absolutely. And I mean, look at look at some of these independent games that have come out. Like uh, Troll Lord Games is one of those companies that um, there is absolutely no political bent in any of their games whatsoever. Castles and Crusades, which is coming to me day after tomorrow. I've I've actually gotten a, a few of their books before, and I've gone through them. Starship Warden was one. Amazing Adventures. Amazing Adventures. You could set that. That's built for like pulp stories, so you can make these pulp stories oh, like cool. Call of Cthulhu and stuff like that. It's nice. basically an open world. You can build anything you want. It's it's an open simulator. Just drop in your shit, homebrew your shit, and get it done. So if we wanted to set something in say 1920s Scandinavia. And it was maybe we got the gods wrong, maybe they maybe they are vicious monsters or, or things like that. You know, we could do stuff like that, and that allows you that freedom. But what comes out from these these very imaginative people, these people who have who have gone through and created it, Venger Satanus, um, Miguel is, Miguel Rivera and Silvia Clemente from the Red Room Channel, um, John Torres, uh, Victor who just did a simple modernity and now he's doing another book I mean, and they churn them out faster than I can, I can, you know, support them. Uh, RPG pundit who lives mm -hmm. in South America somewhere. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, I could be wrong. Uh, he did star adventurer. That was, that is, it's, it's a thin little book, but there's so much possibility when you can stir the imagination to aspire to even just being a hero at the tabletop yes, for yes. just a moment for this person who feels weak <clears throat> and effective. I mean, guys, I was getting my ass kicked. I did not want to, I didn't want to see me, which is what D and D or the one D and D campaign is all about. Oh, well, I just couldn't see me in there. You fucking sociopath. Did you not create a character? What did that character <laughs> look like? Why didn't it look like you? That's on you. That's not on D and D. That was your ass. So when someone, I didn't want to look like me. I wanted to have, you know, a massive long hair. I wanted to have this big fucking broadsword, massive jack muscles. I wanted to wear nothing but a loincloth, <laughs> and I wanted to go into battle, come out covered in someone else's blood, grunting and being like, "Yeah, who the fuck's still standing?" So you basically wanted to be Conan. Conan the Barbarian, there you go. Yeah, Co Conan, Conan the Man. Conan the Barbarian on a meth bender, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Conan, oh, I mean, Conan Barbarian meets Jordan Peterson. Right, right. Look at, I, I, look oh, at what the new Ragnarok is going to be like, dude. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, if we, can just you imagine? picture we did have a Ragnarok in modern day. What would yeah. it look like? All right, yeah. have you guys, since we're on Ragnarok, have you guys considered that the possibility that maybe it's us that bring about Ragnarok? Look at what's happening. Look at look at where the world is is headed. Doesn't it seem okay? So I've been I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks. I I dabble pretty goodly in like occult symbolism and stuff. I and so I've been going back and you looking into. <laughs> I've been going back and looking <laughs> into old old biblical stories like uh, like Samson. And the only this is this is an interesting little Bible trivia bit, but literally the only recorded haircut in the entire Bible led to a guy's eyes being gouged out of his head. I'm just saying, just maybe maybe reconsider the whole haircut thing. But so, you maybe know, he, he has this. Yeah, <laughs> he has this uh, he has this deal with with Yahweh, the the demon blood vampire God, right, who gives him super strength. And uh, yeah. this guy gets super strength and he goes around killing the uh, the Philistines and he's like murdering them by the dozens. And uh, one, one day, you know, his secret gets out and that it's his power resides in his hair and his hair is a sign of well, this covenant that he's got with the blood God. He, di he discloses it to Delilah, right? Yeah. 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 He yeah. tells the, the prostitute. One... He tells the temple prostitute that it's his it's in his hair. And so she goes and tells the guards, it is, it is. And well, she was supposed to be a sacred whore. 
And uh, but anyway, he, he she goes and uh, tells Sacred the guards, Lord. the Philistines, yeah, you like temple prostitute. This is it goes into a, a whole bunch of the the mystery. So shit. like the, uh, the, the polar opposite of like a festal virgin, for example. So, yes, it is. It is exactly that. Yeah, but yeah. So she uh, she rats on him, goes and tells the Philistines. He gets his eyes plucked out after she gives him a haircut. Uh, then. <clears throat> He's paraded around uh, without any strength. You know, look, we captured their hero uh, and he, they, they parade him around all of Philistine and uh, show him off. And then one day they bring him to the, the Grand Temple to celebrate their victory over the, the who was Samson, who was a judge as well as a hero. Uh, which oh. this is before they had kings. So there were judges. This is like the highest place you can be uh hierarchically and so they bring him into the temple and uh while they're doing some other thing they tie him up in between these two pillars and if you if you've studied occultism at all you know what the two pillars represent yeah yo, yo, uh, it's, it's the duality you know so so you've got the the two poles and all of a sudden he's placed in between the two pillars and he's got arms reach on both pillars he becomes the third pillar which is Dude, a that whole... was just what i was thinking i was just about yeah. to say that so like, he himself that, embodies the third pillar yep he embodies he becomes the third pillar where the he he becomes himself the marriage of the two pillars where they come together and what does he do he gets his strength back through Whoa. that union of these two pillars. He regains his strength. And what does he do with his strength? He leans into the pillars and topples both of them. He brings down the entire temple on all the ruling class of the Philistines. Like the story is kind of a, a double edged sword, because if you study, you know, you look into who the Philistines were, it, it's it's basically the us. Giants, right? Yeah, it's basically us. And it's like this victory story of how this guy killed, you know, our ruling oh, yeah. class. But uh, the principle remains the same. The, the principle is accurate and true. The dude brought down the two pillars along with himself. And I, my mind keeps coming back to this over and over. So do you guys think that it's possible that through the things like Raven, through the stuff that you're talking about here, through this like grassroots thing, this uh, uh, where, where we're completely, what, subverting the subversion? <laughs> like, do you think well, that this in that process, it is the bringing down of the kicking off of Ragnarok almost culturally, well, at least? I, I indeed well, would say that by that we are actively trying to end this cycle. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, yeah, as you said, like it's, it's the perfect way of saying it, subversion, subverting the subversion. We are like, you know, that's that's initially what, uh, what sparked me into, you know, doing this, what has turned out into a series. Now, uh, there's definitely coming out a part four coming. Uh, we had some people who can who could unfortunately not uh, make it today, so we're gonna have to do a part four or five, whatever. This is gonna this is I want gonna it. be ongoing. This is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but I, I know, wonder like, uh, I, wonder if I can interject because um, I've sure, heard something go, about uh, go ahead. You've been dualism. For so long, please do. Uh, yeah, uh, but but I wonder because uh, I have so many notes and I, I see that there's like seven pages, so I don't know <laughs> if I should uh, if I should make it an article or or if I should take the highlights or if it should just start. But but uh, he was talking uh, about uh, dualism and um, I find it very interesting because yeah, I prepared something about the same to topic. Um, yeah, well, it, it reminded where... me when you said that thing about Nietzsche, the, the third stage is to be a child. Yeah. Which is the toppling of everything. Yeah. Uh, because uh, what I argue is that um, Norse paganism basically has some uh, dualistic elements. Uh, and I, I do a sort of a cross study with uh, old... Um, Iranian paganism, nice. which definitely, Iranian, Iranian, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, which definitely had started off um, with dualistic elements as well, and turned into full dualism with the Surastar. But uh, we need to clarify what dualism is, uh, because 
uh, I would argue there are two types of dualism, which is dualism in the world and dualism out of this world. Uh, and by in the world, I mean, uh, uh -huh. I, I could base myself on a quote from Spinoza, the philosopher, uh, essentially he was uh, uh, of the tribe, but he was ejected from the tribe, if you remember, uh, because he questioned God or, or whatnot. Uh, but he, but he, mm. <laughs> but he, he, he states that no matter how thin you slice it, things will always have two sides. In the world, no matter what it is, it will have two sides. Uh, and, and there is the thing about um, Jungian uh, du dualism uh, or the duality of man, uh, which claims that uh, if you introduce something good in this world, uh, something correspondingly evil will also arise. Yes. Uh, and for instance, uh, to use an example, if you reduce infant mortality, uh, children will get sick liver. <laughs> yeah. uh, because you reduce the deaths in the world, but uh, the people now have the... less healthy children growing up with yeah. problems that probably would have killed them at birth before. Yeah. So now uh, they have uh, ongoing health problems. I don't know if you, you, you guys are familiar with Edward Dutton, uh, the jolly heretic. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a British um, biologist, uh, which is quite active and uh, in, on YouTube and quite known. Uh, you should definitely check him out because he state, states the same, that uh, we are kind of overwhelmed with uh, genetic mutational load because uh, of civilization, basically. Uh, Civilization negates itself. Uh, civilization makes us weaker. So when we rise to great heights, we also have this great fall. And yes. this is essentially yeah. what is happening now. Um, so they can happen at the same time. Like <laughs> one can go up and one could go down in equal measure. Uh, but anyway, um, if you, you this uh, dualism out of this world is essentially Platonism. Christianity and Zoroastrianism is, this, is the religion where you create this concept of God, sorry, good, concept of good, which is only good, and it's completely yeah. separate from evil. And that's not possible in a physical world. So it's mm -hmm. out of this world. Uh, so that's the sort of dualism to avoid. Uh, and when it comes to Norse paganism uh, and it's, it's, of course, related to other forms of paganism or all the Indo-European types, which is the Roman, the Greek, the Vedic, the Iranian. Uh, and, and most of those records uh, speak about a primordial giant, Ymir being the most famous. Uh, but uh, uh, and in continent, continental Germanic paganism, uh, this giant is called Twisto, and that name means twin. Uh, and in Iranian uh, paganism, the, uh, this twin is separated into two beings, the one being yes. being called Mani, and the other, oh, what? Uh, it, it's a name for the other guy. Uh, but, but essentially, one is good and the other is bad, and uh, the good uh, one kills the bad one well, and creates the world. Speaking uh, and, of Mimir and Mimir. Uh, uh, excuse me. Mimir and Mimir. No, not Mimir. No, no, no. Uh, uh, the primordial gi giant in um, Norse mythology is, uh, I call him Ymir, but yeah, that's Ymir, not my language. Yeah. Well, speaking uh, of twins, so, sorry to, to interrupt you. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick thought. I'll yeah. let you know. Um, Roman paganism, how like Rome was founded, was um, with the twins Romulus and Remus. It's a it's a concept that uh, repeats itself yeah. through yeah, their yeah, stories. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Everywhere. Yeah, uh, but uh, and uh, uh, Snorri, uh, when he wrote about Ymir, uh, he had access. To, I read to three different traditions, but he never really touches into the twin aspect of Ymir. And I believe Ymir was a twin giant as well. And so wow. Snorri gave us a corrupted version. That's what I think because originally this giant that created the world was uh, 
a twin. And as you as you noted, this this um, twin aspect it repeats itself with the, the horse twin, Hengston Horisa, mm -hmm. uh, those guys, and and uh, yeah. Romus and Remulus, or yes, yeah. Uh, but um, and that that's true. But uh, I will I want to quickly think a little about uh, Ragnarok in this regard and a possible dualism that came to me, which is really interesting because we know we know that. Uh, at Ragnarok, uh, at least we don't get to hear about all the gods. Some of the gods just disappear, seemingly. But some of the gods kill each other or, or destroy each other. Uh, and you have, for instance, Freyr, who, who has traded away his sword for the giantess Garid, a magical sword that swings itself. Uh, and because of that, he is killed by Sutur, uh, and the universe is undone just because of that <laughs> because Surtur is um, able to engulf the world in flames and and i find that very interesting because uh, Frey has been described as the shining one uh, a light god and Surtur is a fire giant so could it be like the the good wow. and bad aspect of wow, light yeah. which meets clashes and destroys wow. each other and uh, when it comes to thor Thor and Indra is the same god. Indra is the Vedic version. Yeah. Indra is also uh, red-haired and uh, yeah, yeah a, a, a thunderbolt willing, willing uh, god. And, and Thor, he is this... Donar even has his uh, his female counterpart in um, Ludana. I've been yeah, I've been yeah. working with her uh, alongside the uh, the tribe of Fox, which is another Dutch tribe. And, and Thor is a god who. Sorry, Indra is a god who, 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 and Thor as well, a god who destroys all obstacles. Uh, described as that in the Vedic scriptures, it releases everything. And this serpent uh, in those Vedic myths is a serpent which constrains and it kind of prevents the waters from flooding. So you have this constraining force and this releasing force that <laughs> in Ragnarok <laughs> clash and negate each other. Wow. Uh, uh, also interesting is that Odin has been described, or the name Odin means essentially divine fury. Yeah. And uh, uh, he, he is devoured by Fenrir. Uh, and I've, I've read so, um, Fenrir has been described as the unbound rage because he's so angry for having been bound, right? So it's kind of a, the good and bad aspect of fury as well. That's what I think, at least. And, and you have the oh, trickster. Dude. Do you have Yo, the trickster Loki? Cool. You have the trickster Loki and the guardian Heimdall. They kill each other because they're opposites. Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and, and you look, there's a stolen aspect of that one you were just talking about in the Bible. The temptation uh -huh. of Jesus in the desert by the serpent. And if you think about it, Jesus was a carpenter. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do carpenters use? What's their tool? Hammer. I hammer. Uh, okay. okay. Thor, beard. I'm just saying, like, you know, there, there's a lot of parallels there, right? That I think Christianity just borrowed yes, from absolutely the, the native religions from the people they were trying to, uh, to adopt. And the well, Germanic it's tribes were to assimilate fucking that way, huge. Right? The Ger I mean, yeah. you look at Germany's only been declared a country for this much time in, in our history, right? But if you look as far back as 200 BC, you have people writing about the Germanic tribes. And I mean, it was named Germania by Tacitus and several others just because of the tribes of Germania, right? Now, we, we look at our, our, our world history that's taught in schools, and Germany is a nation that was only built in like 1890 and declared a nation in like 1947. What kind of garbage is that? You know, like, well, I'm sorry, this is one of the oldest cradles of civilization, the oldest artifacts of, of humans worshipping something and humans creating music came from a cave in Germany. You know, you have the Lion Man statue, and I talk about this all the time, yeah. the Lion Man yeah. statue and the Bone Flute. They're over 40,000 years old and were found in a cave in Germany, Both right? Germany yes. and Germania are two different countries. They're not... They, not the same. Germania I mean, I, was. I'd say they're not the same, at least. You know, looking at 
like yeah germany like what we now recognize as germany or deutschland deutschland however you however you want like parts of the yeah, same that, geography that's probably a new country you know like the the more let's say modern Post empire germany the uh, most, most likely the name uh, german means spearman but that's the mo just the most likely uh, yeah well, I've said for a long time that Jesus is Lucifer post castration surgery. It's it's the same archetype. It just just work it huh. back, put the balls back on Jesus, and you have Lucifer. Well, uh, uh, but, but I wonder um, if if I could finalize my argument because it's yeah, very yeah, short, yeah. Yeah. very sure. short um, left. Um, because uh, thinking about all those gods killing each other, and you you have a Tyr, which is a law god, mm -hmm. uh, and and he and Garm kill each other and Garm is kind of guardian of the underworld and, and that that's and, and finally you have kind of uh the dead rising against the uh, Ein Haryar which I also find interesting because it's perhaps the, the divine heroes against the dishonorable dead as we yes. discussed earlier earlier before we started this stream yeah so, so that was more or less my argument oh yeah uh, no I, that's that's, that's brilliant great. There but, but, is a duality to every little battle in Ragnarok. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I think. That essentially Norse paganism is a riddle because yes. we don't know what uh, ended the Golden Age. We don't know who Gulvegi and uh, the Three Maidens were. We don't know, know who whose heart Loki ate in the Iron Forest. So there's so much we don't know. We, we can't really solve the riddle. We don't know the f destiny of all the gods at Ragnarok. You know, uh, I, I honestly feel like that literature is still here. It exists, right? There are these ultra wealthy people that have been collecting and, and hoarding and holding this literature. And I honestly believe that some of them, um, let's just say, some of the past rulers of different countries have gotten their hands on it and decided to go on these artifact hunts, right? <laughs> to find certain spears and, you know, just, just yep. different yep. things from historical um, stories that they believed would aid them in their quests to uh, make greater nations and whatnot. But uh, that, that just tells you that there, there is, those little bits of information are still out there, right? That the the diluted stories that we have from Snorri and and the uh, Codex Regis and the House of Bach, they're they're not the only ones out there. They're just the only ones that we have access to. But one day somebody's gonna break open the cave in the right place and find every piece of information that we've been wanting to know about our culture, about our history, and about all of it. Right? Oh, and preach it. I honestly believe it, it could be anywhere sitting at the bottom of the Gobi that used to be a sea that had an island in it. It could be in North America, buried with some of the giants that, you know, were killed in the Love Dot Cave or whatever the I, case I don't think I don't think we have the time because uh, I think Ragnarok is now. So if it's going to be released, it will have to be pretty well soon because yes. it, it's, it's happening now. So... What if I scanned this stuff? If I was able to translate it and scan it all to you and send it off in a PDF, would you ever believe me? You know what I mean? That's another one. Like, yeah. would you would you be able to look at this and go like, yeah, that's it. Thanks. I, I, I think it's easy at, to see if it's done. Look at Chan Thomas, Chan Thomas, the, the Adam and Eve story. This dude comes out with a book that literally splits Christianity down the middle. I mean, just tells a a version of the creation that is translated from its original text into one language instead of eight stepping stone languages right. losing context the whole way and when he does that the cia says yo you can't do that that's confidential fucking information wow and they seize his work and hold it for over 60 years right this dude literally just translated from original text straight to english that's all he did but the CIA said, no, 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 right? Now, that story that he painted was completely different. And I mean, when you look at the context, because you, you could still find bits and pieces of what the CIA released 65 years later, the, the remaining 59 pages or whatever the case may be out of a 285-page book. But in this story, dude, it tells about 
the the inundations, the global inundations. It tells what causes it that it's a magnetic polar flip because yep. of the iron core of the Earth. I mean, this dude goes wow. into detail that is ridiculous. But the CIA was like, "Yeah, if people know that, we've got big problems. The church will collapse. All this shit will go down. So, people will start living their lives." So, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and and, and that's the thing. If you notice, everything they've been doing in modern society is getting us to break away from forming cultures. They're yeah. telling people, go live in a van by the river by yourself. Don't do it with another group of people or you'll be Branch Davidian. And these were the first two hours of our new Ragnarok podcast episode three. If you want to hear the full podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash greyhorn pagans subscribe to any tier five euros or above and you will get access to the full podcast vip patreons vip patrons get access to the full podcast a week early so thank you all for listening don't forget to give us that sweet sweet five star rating and go to our patreon for the full episodes again that is patreon.com forward slash greyhorn pagans five dollar tier or above the bronze tier or above thank you and enjoy your day or evening or night or whatever it is for you Thank you. Until next time. When you shop at a Walmart Vision Center, you get it. You know that you'll spend a little less on stylish glasses for the whole family. Welcome to the Vision Center. Let me know if you need help finding the perfect frame. Hey, Mom, you were right. These glasses are cool. Hun, they take our insurance. That means Papa's getting a new pair, too. Whoa, glasses start at just $39. Next stop, groceries. So you can get a little more of what you need. Find a Vision Center near you. Save money, live better. Walmart.